Uh, for the next um, 20 minutes or so, I'll just take you through uh, some recent updates in the field of HIV medicine. And also we'll look into the guidelines um, of um, antiretroviral therapy, uh, the latest guidelines, and uh, mainly concentrating on some of the recent changes that have come about, and um, uh, more so looking at the things that are clinically relevant to us on a day-to-day -day basis. So one thing that hasn't changed in the field of HIV is the magnitude of a problem that it is. And um, we know that there are a huge um, pool of patients who are HIV infected. The uh, latest WHO updates uh, show that almost 38 million people are affected with 1.7 million newly affected and about 770,000 deaths. Um, magnitude of the problem is not uniformly distributed. It's predominantly distributed in the Africas, uh, both uh, North and South America and Southeast Asia. Uh, where does India stand? Unfortunately, we are among the top few countries with people living with HIV AIDS. Uh, the number has remained static at about 2.1 million, um, but the number of new HIV infections and number of HIV related deaths have been slowly reducing over the last few years. So sometime in 2015, 2016, there was this initiative of 1990-90. This is not related to the 1960 rule which Sir was talking about. This is actually um, trying to make 90% of people aware of the HIV status because the biggest problem still for us is that we find people unaware of the HIV status and coming very late in their disease. So to make 90% of people aware of their disease, 90% of people on antiretroviral therapy and 90% completely virally suppressed, which is the main aim of uh, antiretroviral therapy. So where do we stand as of now? And this target was by 2020. So in terms of achieving that target, uh, we have about 79% who are aware of their status, 56% on therapy, and really viral suppression, uh, we, don't have, we just don't have the data from India as how many are actually completely virally suppressed. So it's going to take time, but we do seem to be heading in the right direction. So I'll quickly switch gears and move to updates in um, antiretroviral therapy and um, what's new. So this whole um, talk about when to start ART has completed really a full circle. So when ART first started way back in the 1990s, there was only a single drug. And everybody said, use that drug as soon as possible because there was nothing else. Slowly with time, people realized that you could wait um, until the CD4 fell to 350, 200. And subsequently, uh, there was great realization that HIV is not only associated with infections, but associated with a lot of inflammatory disorders. And several key studies actually showed us that HIV is no longer just about opportunistic infections, but is a whole <clears throat> host of inflammation that occurs in the body and so ART as soon as possible at diagnosis on the same day is what is recommended. So what has changed over the last few years? Why has you know this change occurred? Several reasons. One of the main reasons is that the drugs that we have nowadays are much less toxic, more potent and tolerable than the drugs we had in the past. So that is one of the major changes that has occurred. We know that there is a lot of association between HIV and inflammation. So cardiovascular disease, renal disease, hematological disease has all been linked to HIV. It's not just opportunistic infections that occur towards the late stage of HIV. And most importantly, one of the landmark trials, the HPTN052 trial actually showed that ART treatment in a person with HIV infection is the biggest and the most important way of preventing transmission. So these three points have actually led us to change our practice to start ART for everyone with the new diagnosis of HIV. So this has actually simplified things. If you look at all the guidelines worldwide, whether it's the American guidelines, British HIV guidelines, European guidelines, WHO and NACO, the guidelines uniformly say the same thing. So it's not complicated. Anybody with HIV, whether they're symptomatic, whether they have a CD4 count of 150, 450, or 750, the <clears throat> conclusion is that they need to be treated at the earliest. So this is the list of drugs that we have at our disposal today. So from, from where we started, we have come a long way in the development of a lot of classes of drugs and several molecules 
within each class. Um, we have the NRTIs, NNRTIs, um, fusion inhibitors, and protease inhibitors. But the drugs that are really changing the way we practice are the uh, INSTEs or the integrase stand transfer inhibitors. So they are Taltogravir, but more recently Dolutogravir and um, Mictogravir are the drugs that are really changing the way we practice HIV medicine. So I'll just talk a little bit about these drugs and why they're so useful and why they're so important. So th these are the main drugs that are available in this ca category. As I said, Raltogravir, l vitogravir Dolutogravir, and Victogravir. Basically, they function by um, inhibiting the insertion of the HIV DNA into the CD4 cell DNA. So they block this integrase enzyme, which is res responsible for integration of the HIV DNA into the host cell. So why are they so potent? Or why are they better than all the drugs that we have? So one is they're really well tolerated. Second, it's very easy to give. It's once, once daily dose, except for people who have received this class of drugs earlier. So in a naive patient, it's once a day, day, once a day dose. Really, they don't have other drug interactions. Drugs like efavirenz, protease inhibitors, they ha have a lot of drug interactions with commonly used medications in HIV, like TB medications, rifampicin, anti-epileptics. So many of the other agents have a lot of drug interactions. But these INSTEs really don't have much drug interactions and they're easy to take. So if you look at this graph, this is, uh, these are the multiple studies that have been done in patients comparing dolotogravir and standard therapy. And you can see that really the side effects and tolerability is extremely high. So this is just looking at the efficacy. So the most important um, in any ART drug is how efficacious it is. So these are just multiple studies. I'm not going to go through all of them. It's, these are all the studies that have been done comparing dolotogravir as an agent with the other standards of therapy, efavirenz, uh, boosted protease inhibitors, and it has compared and it has shown that it is either superior to these drugs or it is comparable or non-inferior. So in terms of efficacy, dolotogravir as an agent compared to efavirenz and boosted protease inhibitors is an excellent choice. It is non-inferior and on top of that, it achieves viral suppression much, much faster than any of these agents. And that is what we want. When we start somebody on ART, we want them to be virally suppressed as quickly as possible. And dolotogravir achieves this very, very quickly, sometimes within eight weeks as well. What about emergence of drug resistance? Again, this is an excellent drug because it has a very high genetic barrier to resistance. What do I mean by this? It, it means that when you're exposed to this drug, even if there are some issues with adherence, mutations develop very, very slowly, and it takes several mutations for this, for this drug to actually become resistant. So even if you have resistance to another class of the same drug, like raltegravir, you can still use this drug because it takes several mutations before this drug actually becomes resistant. So people on this drug don't really have to keep changing their regimens much. So excellent drug in terms of its genetic barrier to, to um, resistance. So just looking at some of the guidelines, world over, everyone has changed to using the main drug is dolotogravir. So this is the DHHS guidelines from 2018, 2019. So if you look here, uh, bictogravir, dolotogravir, again dolotogravir, raltogravir. So combinations using an INSTE is the first line of therapy world over. So you can combine it with any of the other two drugs. This is abacavir and lamivudine or tenofovir and lamivudine. Either of the preparations of tenofovir can be used. It can be uh, tenofovir alafenamide, which is a newer agent, which has less toxicity to the bone and the kidneys, or the previously used uh, tenofovir disoproxyl uh, is also an, um, an option. So WHO changed its guidelines in 2019. So if you look at their guidelines, again, everything has changed to using a dolotogravir base. So dolotogravir based therapy with either tenofovir and um, uh, lamivudine or about abacavir and lamivudine. So WHO has also changed its recommendations in terms of first line therapy. Um, so these are the interim guidelines that came out in 2018 and the subsequent 2019 guidelines. So dolotogravir is recommended 
as the preferred option when you start somebody on antiretroviral therapy. If dolutegravir has not been used in the first line and we need to use second line therapy, that is the recommendation. An alternative to using dolutegravir in the first line is either low dose efavirenz or normal dose efavirenz. Where do we stand? NACO updated the guidelines in 2018 October. Uh, unfortunately, the recommendations still stay at um, the previous recommendations of using tenofovir, lamivudine, and efavirenz, and other combinations um, with efavirenz, or using a boosted protease inhibitor. So our NACO guidelines haven't changed. We don't have dolutegravir available in the national program, but it is quite freely available and um, really not that expensive um, in the private sector. So this is about guidelines for HIV-1. What about for HIV-2? So HIV-2 is much less common, and really there were no guidelines on how to manage somebody with HIV-2 till very recently. And um, the DHS's guidelines of 2019 came up with an update on how to treat HIV-2. Remember, HIV-2 has some differences in the way it is treated. It is not susceptible to NNRTIs, so efavirenz, nevirapine, you really cannot use that. So the traditional teaching was to use a boosted protease inhibitor uh, that is effective against um, HIV-2, either boosted lopinovir or boosted darunavir. So that is still recommended, but more recent studies, as I was telling you, dolutegravir has changed the way we uh, treat HIV. So that is again still recommended as a drug of choice for patients with HIV-2. So really, if you're using a dolutegravir-based regimen, there's not much difference between HIV-1 and HIV-2 in terms of um, treatment. So there are several novel ART strategies that have come out in the last few years. Some have been successful and some have not. So we just go through a few of these. There are a lot of newer regimens. Most of the world is switching to single pills, low toxicity regimens. And one of the things that I want to talk about is actually dual therapy and whether it is um, effective or not. So dual therapy, you can, you can think of it as two drugs given for HIV, either at the initiation of therapy, or you can use it in somebody who has been well suppressed and you just want to maintain viral suppression. So why dual therapy is because there are concerns of long-term cumulative toxicities, especially with a drug like tenofovir because it causes renal and bone toxicity. And also the development of dolutegravir as a drug, which is really highly efficacious, suppresses viral load very fast, and it's safe. So just go through two studies. Uh, one is the Gemini 1 and 2 studies, which actually looked at um, ART naive patients <clears throat> and randomized them to receive um, um, either dolutegravir and lamivudine or standard triple drug therapy with tenofovir, um, emtricitabine, and dolutegravir. So two drugs versus three drugs. They had about 715 patients that um, they looked at. And primarily, they wanted to look at what was the viral suppression um, at the end of 48 weeks and subsequently at 144 weeks. So this is the uh, some of the results from um, the 48-week analysis. And if you look, the virological response is really very good, even with the two-drug regimen, 91% versus 93%, not much differences, and really not much differences in toxicity. Saying this, I think it's still early to say whether really we can move towards a two-drug regimen, because we have the results only at 48 weeks. We would really need to see what things look like at a later point in time, at 96 weeks or at 148 weeks. So the SWORD 1 and 2 study was a little different. It looked at people who are already virally suppressed. So people who are on any regimen who are virally suppressed, they were randomized to either get either dolutegravir and rilpivirin or continue their whatever existing ART they were on. And if they continue the ART, they were switched at 48 weeks to this combination of two drugs with dolutegravir and rilpivirin. So again, this is the 48-week data. It shows that both the drugs had extremely good viral suppression with no, not much difference. A very recent update uh, had come out a couple of months ago uh, with the results at 144 weeks, 
and that still shows there is very very similar results between the two drug and the three drug group so can we push this monotherapy does it work well it has been tried so this study looked at 175 people randomized them uh, to either switch to dolutegravir monotherapy or continue their st standard triple therapy um, if you look at this actually up to week 24 it seemed that both arms were okay but after that there was a significant increase in the number of patients who developed viral resistance and uh, this study actually had to be stopped so from week 24 to 48 actually there was almost a 10 percent difference in um, um, the development of viral resistance so definitely no monotherapy there's no role for monotherapy even with the best drugs that we have today there's really no more no role for monoth monotherapy dual therapy i think we need longer follow-up and more studies before we can we can really say that dual therapy would work <clears throat> what are some of the newer therapeutic considerations that are available one of it one of this is a longer acting insti or uh, which is cabotegravir it's being formulated as both a pill and an intramuscular injection which can which has a very very long half life so it can be given once every four weeks so this is being looked into for both prophylaxis and <clears throat> as potential treatment so if this um, proves to be successful uh, this gives us a chance to use a drug that is extremely long acting so to take away things like poor compliance um, monoclonal antibodies like ibalizumab have recently been studied it's been fda approved to be used only in extremely drug resistant and treatment experienced people who really don't have any 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 choices remaining how does it work it works by blocking the entry um, of hiv into the cell um, and small studies have looked at people who are extremely drug resistant and have really no classes of drug left and have found uh, varying degrees of success uh, with this monoclonal antibodies so maybe there's some role for the use of this uh, moving forwards so we'll take a little uh, detour we'll talk about hiv transmission and for the last few years there has been uh, this uh, motto or this slogan has been going on that is u is equal to u and what it means is that undetectable means untransmittable so if you don't have virus that is detectable in the blood it means that you cannot really transmit the virus so how did we come to know this and mainly through the partner one and two study which uh, uh, the partner one study actually looked at both uh, homosexual and heterosexual zero discordant couples it was continued as a partner two study particularly in gay men who are zero discordant and um, it followed them up for a long period of time um, the positive partner was completely virally suppressed um, multiple lakhs of uh, uh, without a condom and there were some acquisition of hiv infection but it was not phylogenetically linked to the partner um, and many other participants actually uh, had had unprotected sexual exposure with uh, other people as well so in terms of direct link to their partner there was actually zero uh, transmissions of hiv so this is shown us this is started from 2010 so a very long study really shown that this u is equal to u um, actually um, uh, stands the test of time so i'll briefly talk about a little bit about opportunistic infections because still what we see is in our practice is majority we see a lot of opportunistic infections that we still haven't really uh, been able to overcome so talk a little bit about mac prophylaxis uh, our understanding of um, things has changed a little bit a little bit about cryptococcal meningitis and a little bit about art initiation in uh, the setting of an oi and what is the risk of iris and some recent studies uh, related to that so we know that as the cd4 keeps falling uh, the risk of opportunistic infections uh, keeps increasing and uh, when we reach a cd4 below 50 we know that the risk is the greatest and um, infections such as CMV, retinitis, disseminated CMV disease, and MAC all exist at a CD4 of less than 50. Previously, we were taught that when the CD4 is less than 50, we need to put everybody on MAC prophylaxis with azithromycin and uh, PCP prophylaxis as well with Bactrim. But recently, uh, there's this uh, update that has come that 
in somebody who's even if the CD4 is less than 50, if you are able to start effective antiretroviral therapy immediately, there is really no need to actually institute this uh, MAC prophylaxis with uh, weekly azithromycin. In a situation where somebody is not willing to take therapy or doesn't have an effective regimen that can be used or is failing therapy with no option, then there's a recommendation that actually you have to put them on MAC prophylaxis. But MAC prophylaxis for everybody, especially if going to start on antiretroviral therapy, is no longer recommended. I'll just talk a little about cryptococcal meningitis. It's still one of the um, severe opportunistic infections that we see. Every, I mean, every point in time, there are several patients with cryptococcal meningitis in the ward. And um, it sometimes is difficult to keep them for a long time, treat them with a toxic drug like amphotericin. So this study actually came out uh, from South Africa, where it looked at patients with HIV infection and cryptococcal meningitis, looking to see if there's any simplification of the regimen that can be used. We've traditionally been giving two weeks of amphotericin and then fluconazole as a consolidation phase. So this looked at a purely oral regimen of high dose fluconazole with flu cytosine versus one week of amphotericin and flu cytosine versus the conventional two weeks of amphotericin and flu cytosine. Important here to remember that the flu cytosine is, component is extremely important in all these um, combinations. And um, actually, surprisingly, the outcomes at two and 10 weeks actually showed that even the one week of amphotericin plus flu cytosine or the two weeks of fluconazole plus flu cytosine really works very well. And you don't really have to keep the patient for two weeks and give amphotericin and all the associated complications uh, with it. So there seems to be a simpler option for the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis rather than having to give um, amphotericin for uh, two weeks, which is very difficult sometimes in uh, low middle income countries with limited resources. So there is always this dilemma in somebody with an opportunistic infection as to when should we start ART? And uh, we know now from multiple studies that early is definitely better than late. That's the uh, rule of the thumb, except in certain situations, you would wait for a little bit of time, such as cryptococcal meningitis, when you would actually start a little later. And when I say late, I mean by about four weeks. Otherwise, any other opportunistic infection by about two weeks, two to four weeks, we should be initiating antiretroviral therapy. So what is the concern about starting ART early? Is there really any concern? And I'll just highlight this through this case. This is a 35-year-old man who had some weight loss, some low-grade fevers, and um, he was found to be HIV-1 positive. CD4 was 130. He was evaluated, didn't find any opportunity infection, and was started on um, standard um, NACO uh, antiretroviral therapy. Three weeks later, he comes with very high fevers. He's developed multiple swellings in the neck with discharging sinuses. Um, so he's re-evaluated, his repeat chest x-ray is done, um, it shows multiple infiltrates and his sputum AFB is actually positive. So multiple lymph nodes in the neck, uh, pre-initiation of ART x-ray, post-initiation. So what is this, what, what is the syndrome that he has, has? Basically it is iris and this is what it, what it is, is a paradoxical, paradoxical deterioration in the clinical status after starting antiretroviral therapy despite satisfactory control of viral replication. So the lower the CD4 count and the more potent the drug, the higher the risk of virus. So you start um, somebody uh, whose CD4 is very low, plus you now have potent drugs like dolutegravir, which rapidly reduce the viral load and uh, improve the CD4 count. So your risk of virus is going to be higher. So basically it's because of an exuberant immune response. So just two more, two, two more slides. So this study looked at uh, prevention of iris in patients with uh, uh, um, with active tuberculosis. Uh, patients with CD4 of less than 100 who had started ATT less than 30 days ago. And uh, they randomized them and gave them actually steroids versus no steroids. So steroids for a month versus no steroids. And though it didn't have any outcome of the mortality, it did reduce the risk of virus from 32.5% uh, to 46.7%. So iris definitely reduced TB associated iris. So maybe one strategy is to use um, steroids in a situation where you want to start ART and um, the person has underlying TB. So I'm going to stop with this. Just to conclude, HIV is still a major burden 
uh, we see a lot of patients with HIV. It has become more a chronic disease like diabetes, hypertension, um, rather than an acute um, sort of uh, high mortality related disease. We have several options for antiretroviral therapy and uh, we need to make the right choice taking into account patient characteristics, um, other parameters, um, and uh, other drugs that the patient is on. is on. Several newer strategies look promising like dual therapy, but we need to wait for further evidence before we can really um, justify those strategies. And uh, really, uh, HIV prevention is something really big. There's no single answer to it, but treatment of uh, a patient with HIV seems to be the easiest and best method to actually um, uh, prevent uh, HIV transmission. Thank you.